Hello, everyone. I am Jonathan. I am Quixel's friendly and ever-present community manager. With me today is a very special guest and colleague, Victor Ullman. He will be covering some seriously in-depth techniques to develop a variety of smart materials using Quixel Mixer. This is going to be about an hour stream, maybe a little longer. And as always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to talk and chat in the uh, chat. I will take as many as I can, and occasionally we'll get you guys on air. With that, Victor, let's go, buddy. Hey, thanks for the introduction. So really, really excited to be to be back in these streams, uh, back on the in the radio waves. It's uh, it's been a long time. It's, uh, it feels good. So as you said, Jonathan, we'll be taking a look at how to um, create some stuff in Mixer, um, and th that stuff is smart materials. So. Um, we can, before we do that, we can actually start looking at some of the upcoming smart materials that's going to be coming up in the next release. So let me just open it up here. Ooh, so, upcoming, you say? <laughs> so we've, we're trying to cover as many bases as possible, uh, covering you know metals, fabrics, wood, metal, uh, stuff that's good for you know weapons and tanks and all, all kinds of stuff. Just trying to be. Um, make stuff that's use, uh, useful for as many as possible. So um, this is just a, um, just a snippet of what's coming. Uh, really excited uh, to see what you guys will be uh, creating with this. And um, with that said, um, you will be, um, one thing that's coming up is uh, a way for us to start releasing these materials um, sort of between the big updates. So um, uh, you can you can expect to see some some of that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, during the development, and we'll also be I can actually bring this up again so I have something to look at while I'm talking. So we're also going to be looking at uh, or creating smart materials based on sort of collections, uh, based uh, focusing on themes and biomes, uh, things like that. So say Japanese uh, Japanese collection of smart materials or Icelandic collection of smart materials. So I'm super excited about that as well. Um, but yeah, so as I said, can't wait to see what you guys will uh, make with this or with these. And so as we said before, the focus here will be smart materials, um, tips and tricks, best practices, sort of showing how um, I and, and, and the team um, sort of go about creating these smart materials. So in this one, in this stream, we'll be focusing on a wood material. So this is like a ref sheet um, or one of the many ref sheets that we're sort of assembling based on sort of practical uses of materials. Um, and here's another uh, for plastics, you know, for leathers, things like that. And so what I like to do is say I'm, I, I want to make some uh, wood as we're going to be focusing on this in this tutorial or live stream. Um, you know, I look at the references, I find some, some more, um, preferably real world uh, materials. Uh, it's always good to see sort of how materials are, are used and read and sort of uh, applied in games. But sort of to create the material, I always prefer and recommend you use um, real world photography and things like that. So sort of then that, that I'm mishmash here uh, between the two. And you might see some really ugly scribbling here and there. And it's just me sort of um, circling different uh, different kinds of details that I that I want to see and create in my materials, like the grease down here, some fine cuts uh, on the surface, and some edge wear uh, on this AK, for example, and some more grease down here. So I'm just trying to isolate and identify as many sorts of wear and tear and uh, weathering uh, effects as possible. So with that said, let's actually try and create this. Uh, you probably saw the thumbnail. Uh, so I'll try and create something similar um, to that in the stream. And so I hear I'm in, I'm in Mixer. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain um, um, as much as possible. For, so um, even beginners can follow along. Um, so please stop me, Jonathan, if I'm sort of raising away. <laughs> oh, so, never. <laughs> so First of all, before we get started, I just want to change this blank um, project to sort of a 3D project. And I'll uh, do that by switching out the type from plane to shader ball, which is the default model um, that I 
generally use when uh, I start creating materials. Later down the line, I start using, I generally start using some assets from the library, and we'll take a look at that later as well. So now that we have a model here, let's start by applying a couple of uh, a couple of materials. So I'll just browse my local library, uh, search for wood, and I have a couple of favorites here. Uh, this one I find is a really good base for a lot of things like this. And the first thing I want to do is I want to make this less saturated and a lot darker. And I'll also go ahead and reduce the contrast. So if you haven't used Mixer in a while, uh, this is this is uh, a I don't want to say new, but relatively new um, feature where you can actually control control the opacity and the contrast, uh, blend modes, etc. Per per channel or per map. So I'll just reduce the contrast a little bit here and make this look a little bit more worn, something like this maybe. There we go. Just going on feeling here. You can always go back and change it later if you want. And next up, I'll do another wood. And this one has a lot more defined uh, grains, which is something you often see in these uh, references for, you know, lacquered uh, AK handles and things like that. And I'm actually going to change the uh, placement to tiling for this one uh, because, you know, the models I'm going to be applying it to is going to um, has good UVs that are properly aligned. And I know how the UVs on this on this one looks. So um, I'll just set it to tiling for this one. You can at any time go back and change it should you want to. And then I'll just set the rotation to 90 so we get some nice sort of streaking across the mesh here. And I'll do the same thing on this one. Down the contrast and make it darker to match it a bit more. Uh, if you want to, you can just hit middle mouse button click uh, on the uh, on the color swatch there, and that's going to match it to the underlying uh, material. So that's actually a little bit too too dark in my opinion. I'll do something like this a bit more red maybe. Like that. I'll try not to bore you with me fiddling too much with these. There we go. I think a lot of people want to see that, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not a science, really. It's just like what looks good. Um, I guess some people would say it's a science. <laughs> so, and I'll go ahead and reduce the reduce the roughness a little bit to make it look a bit more lacquered. But I don't want to overdo it because I'm going to be adding a lot more layers um, on top that's going to affect the roughness. And as I said before, you can always go back. Like everything here is completely non-destructive. Um, so now we have a pretty good base here, but as you can see, like why why did I add this layer? Like there's there's no point of having two layers. Well, let me tell you why. I'll go ahead and create a mask stack here. I'm clicking this button down here in the bottom left, and this opens up a new um, a new part of the of the UI, uh, which is sort of like another layer stack. And what you can do here is you, you create masks uh, using procedural patterns or images or you know. Yeah, a whole bunch of things. So what I'll do is I want to expose the underlying wood. So how do I do that? Well, I'll use the curvature component here. So you might be wondering what, what happened here. So if I hit nine on the keyboard or just go to the layer mask here, you can see that we're getting a curvature. And th this is uh, generated in real time based on uh, the mesh and the, and the uh, normal. So what I will do here is I will reduce the levels, sort of tighten everything up a little bit. You see what's happening there? Like we're getting way more contrast here. So now we're really getting the edges edges uh, defined. There we go, that looks good. But now the complete opposite happened. Now I only get this on the edges. Well, so I'll just go ahead and hit invert. And there we go. And there we go. So looking okay but I do want the underlying material here to be a bit darker because generally, at least in my observations on, obviously depending on the type of material you're working on, type of wood and treatment and everything, uh, the edges generally get darker, at least on stuff that's being hand and sort of handled and tossed around and, you know, um, picks up a lot of grime and stuff like that. So I'll just darken this a little bit, something like that. That's looking pretty good. And while I'm at this stage, I also want to quickly touch upon different ways of 
sort of approaching or building these materials. There are like there is no written like this is the way you have to do it. Uh, but the way I, I prefer to do it is to actually build the materials in a logical way. So I actually start with the base materials and then build my way up. So say I'm working on a painted metal, for example. I would start with the metal and then add the paint on top of that. You could obviously create the paint first and then sort of mask in some metal just around the edges. But it, like to me, it just makes sense to actually use the layer system in sort of the proper layered way. Um, but that's, that's just... Um, what I prefer, like you can do whatever you want. So we got a pretty good start here. Um, I might just go back and tweak this just a little bit more. There we go. And reduce the contrast a little bit more to make it less sort of defined. There we go. So one more thing that, I'm, that I noticed in a lot of my references is that you're getting a lot of scrape marks on, um, on, the, on the butts and the handles and the grips and what have you. So what I'll do is I'll create a solid layer this time. And uh, these layers are super cheap. They have no textures or anything. It's just solid colors across the entire, uh, across, the, across the board. So I'll once again, open up the um, mask stack. And this time I'll use a map instead of a curvature. So what this allows me to do is, it allows me to load uh, or reference a texture or an image can be a custom image on your on your machine. Um, you can just add image, and if you add an image, it's gonna it's gonna um, uh, stay around. Like you, you can you can load that in as many layers as possible. It gets added to a list here. But you can also uh, reference a layer map. So if I click that and then go to the rosewood veneer, which is base wood, I'll actually name this base wood just to reduce the confusion, and I'll call this sort of grain wood there we go if we hop back here and go into the mask you can see what's going on here so now we're actually seeing the a grayscale version of the albedo map of this layer so and with that we can do some pretty cool stuff oh and worth noting you can also use metalness roughness normal ao and displacement depending on what you want to do uh, but for this case and um, the albedo is more than more than fine so once again i'll hop on the range here and adjust that. I'll set it to somewhere around, actually I'll invert it, like zero, two maybe. And I'll up this to like maybe zero, three to get, a re get it really tight here. There we go. So this is way over the top. So let's go ahead and, you know, just drop a brightness contrast. So um, for those people new to, new to Mixer, um, I should have mentioned this before. You have two buttons up here in the mask stack. This one is the components. And you can see these as sort of, um, I don't know, things gener um, uh, generating stuff, like generating noise or patterns, um, normal direction, curvature, things like that. And then you have the modifiers in this one here. And um, brightness contrast is a modifier. So I'll just go ahead and drop that there um, reduce the brightness and up the contrast a bit, like three. And I'll tweak the, there we go. Now we're getting some nice streaks going across there, but it's not looking pretty. So how do we fix that? We can start by hiding the albedo so we can just work with the contrast or the roughness. So one way that I also like working with, with smart materials is to constantly toggling back and forth between these, uh, between the maps. So the albedo and the uh, roughness, uh, metalness, if I, if I have that normal, so uh, if we check the roughness here, we can go in here and I can change the blend mode to uh, say overlay and we can reduce the brightness because we don't want to overdo it. We still just want slight, slight variance in the roughness here. So I'll up it just a bit, there we go. And while we're on the topic of modifying or adjusting the, the different maps, I can actually change the blend mode from opacity masked, which is the, the default blend mode when you're working on 3D assets. So if I change this to from above and I up the threshold and then reduce the wrapped underlying, you can see that we're actually getting, uh, we're getting, having the normal map being affected by, by the pattern here or the shapes, uh, shapes here. 
So if I just tweak these and make it more subtle, we can actually start seeing the scrape marks here on the model, which is pretty cool in my opinion. So let's just sort of 098. Let's just tweak these values just a little bit so they're more subtle, like so. And I'll unhide the albedo. I'll make it a bit more sort of wood colored, like exposed wood, like something like that. And we can play around with the with the blend modes here. Maybe try an overlay, uh, brighten it a bit. Mm, no, I think I prefer to to have it as normal actually. And I'll just reduce the opacity on only this channel. That's pretty cool. All right, what do we do next? So let's let's try and do some fine scrape marks. And um, once again, I'll make a. So we can just bring bring the references up here, so we can take a look. I'm thinking. Yeah, we need to do some fine edge wear. We need to do some chips like this. So let's go ahead and make a solid layer here. And I'll set the albedo once again to be like a wood, like a light wood color. And open up the mask or yeah, the mask stack. And once again, I'm going to create a map, a map component. And seeing as I'm referencing the an already existing layer i don't need to do any other work on the projection or anything like that because it's it's using the box projection specified here in the placement so if we hop back in here and um, i'll just tweak the range once again i'll invert it maybe 0 0.35 or something like that i'll tighten this up to maybe around halfway there Check this out. It's a little bit tighter, maybe. There we go. Nope. Let's try and invert this. I'm just, I'm just fiddling around here right now, sort of see what I can, what I can come up with. So opacity. Uh, no. I think it was better before. So. Let's try and do the sort of fine edge wear instead. Actually, I, I can use the same layer because it's, it's going to use the same color anyways. So let's hop in the in the mask mask stack once again. I just I just cleared it to make, to make a new one. So let's create a curvature instead. So just so you know what I'm talking about. So I want to do the really fine edge wear that we're looking at here and this on this AK grip. So I will up the tightness. So you have this slider which controls or which lets you uh, control what, what frequencies you want to pick up in the curvature. So I'll set this around halfway or something like that, getting a nice balance here. And I'll once again tighten up, tighten this up and tighten the high end up here as well, maybe 0 0.65, something like that. Yeah. And when, if you look at the edges here, like they're really uniform and they look, just look procedural and like not interesting. So to fix that, I can actually use a mask here. Uh, once again, reference a layer map. I'll again use a base wood and I'll set this to multiply. As you can see, we're getting some break up here, but I wanna really boost this up like way up here, like zero, zero seven or something like that, and then do zero eight five, maybe. And I'll tweak these values, maybe get a, a bit tighter, just so we're sort of getting some edge edge wear there. And maybe tighten this up, take the high end there. Once again, not an exact science. Something like that. And then I can set this to overlay and maybe I want to boost the value here. Zero, like 84, 85% brightness and reduce the opacity. So now we're getting some really strong 
I'll use to reduce the opacity or the saturation. So you know, some really punchy highlights on the around the fine uh, around the edges. You can toggle this on and off so you can sort of see what's happening. And do stop me, Jonathan, if there are any questions that pop up. Meanwhile, so I can get a chance to drink some tea. Some tea, huh? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, most of the questions I'm handling just fine in chat. Wonderful. As always, Thank guys, you. any questions you have, please let us know. I will find it some time to get into Victor's uh, sermon here. Yeah, if I can, sh if I can shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're doing a fantastic job, though. I mean, this material is just... I look away for one minute. I look back, and it's like, wow, look at this. It's completely different now. <laughs> All right, cool. So we're 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 getting there. Like it's it's starting to shape up. Uh, so if we sort of go back here and just take a look at like it was you know the first layer, and just you know toggle visibility, like just a couple of layers are really making a big difference here. So, but we we've been focusing like on the edgeware mainly, like the edge definition. Um, you know how uh, the underlying material sort of shines through and the fine de fine edge details. So let's focus a bit on breaking up the surfaces a little bit. If we take a look here, like it's it's pretty much just flat. Like we've got some interesting grains going on here, but I wanna sort of add some more surface grime that's not sort of limited to the edges. So I'll make once again a solid layer, you know, optimization and everything. I'll drop the drop the brightness a little bit on this. And this is actually like I'm thinking this is not a detail that I've seen on the references, but I I think it looks kind of cool um, when I when I played around with it. So I'll go ahead and do it anyways. So I'll load, load a map here, but instead of using a layer map, I'm gonna specify library asset. And what this does, it allows me to click browse library and browse my local library. So if I remove the search query there and just go to imperfection, I can browse the imperfections here and I really like using these because they're cheap. Um, like the, it's just like a map. It's just a roughness or a mask. So if I search for uh, grunge, for example, and like for, for for people who are not used to working with imperfections, that might just look like a mess. But once you start working with them, you sort of quickly you quickly get in, you get some favorites that you always sort of uh, return to that um, that generally work well. So like this one, for example, I love this one. It's it has this really noisy, but still very organic and natural looking patterns. So if we take a look at it here, you can see what I mean. But as I as I briefly touched upon before, seeing as this has not been projected by any layer, um, uh, I have to do that myself. So fortunately, there is a projection modifier here at the top. And here you can specify tiling, freeform, or box projection. And for this one, I obviously want to use box projection. So. Here I can control the direction, you know, the rotation, um, and yeah. So this is pretty good, but it's not defined at all. So what I have to do is once again adjust the range. Uh, you see me coming back to to the range adjustments pretty frequently, but it's pretty it's a pretty important part here. So I'll once again try and sort of meet them up in the middle. Like maybe seven, six, seven. I'll look at the map. So what I like to do is, you, even though you're dragging the slider, you can still sort of toggle back and forth between the between the different previews, which I find myself doing all the time. So something like maybe zero five ish, something like that. So now we're getting these sort of nice splotches on the surface. And, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, hey, this could be, you know, um, like a, a military guy building a trench and he's, you know, splatching some, I don't know, plaster, just general grime. And it just find it, it gives it a nice rhythm and break up on the surface. Um, so, but it's still not very defined. Like it's defined, but it, it, it doesn't... You know, it's, it's just there, like it's just all across the surface. So what I'll do to fix that is, once again, rely on the curvature. And what's cool about this curvature being real time is that any changes you make here that affects the displacement or normal actually affects the curvature. And everything happens completely instantly. So if I would go down here and add a bunch of like gravel in a layer, 
yeah, you was, that will be picked up in the curvature. So I absolutely love this feature and it's just so tactile and hands-on and just, you know, lets you be super creative. And I'll set this to multiply. And right now we're getting the opposite of what we're after. So I'm just gonna invert this, or you could uh, use edges only uh, or cavities only, depending on what you want to do. I guess I could quickly cover these here. So this is the default curvature. If I just put the levels back to where they were, you can see that we've got a nice mid gray sort of uh, neutral color with the, um, with the uh, cavities being black and the edges being uh, towards white, the brighter spectrum. And if we change this, this to edges only, we're getting everything except the edges black or dark and the edges are brighter. And obviously the opposite is true for, for cavities only, which sort of um, highlights the cavities. And if you do edges and cavities, unlike the default curvature, you're actually getting both the edges and the cavities um, towards the bright and you're getting a, um, a dark, um, like black where there is no detail. So um, depending on what you want to do, make sure you, you sort of flick through these and see what sort of uh, gives you what you're looking for. But I'll just um, resort to the default curvature for this and I'll up the tightness a bit and invert. And once again, sort of find a nice sweet spot here around the middle, like maybe zero seven, something like that. So, if you look at this, now we're actually getting a nice breakup in the, uh, um, like we're breaking up the uh, the noise pattern there or the noise texture. So if you can, if you want to, you can adjust, you can specify soft mesh, which is sort of softens and, and broadens the um, the edges there. And you know, you can always fill around with this if you want more or less edge contribution. Like that, you can go back and tweak the map here or the levels on the maps, we're getting some, maybe get some larger areas like that. It's looking pretty cool. And you know, there are a whole bunch of more steps you can take. If you, if you wanna break this up even further and reduce the, the sort of procedural look, you can, you know, add a noise, for example, like just a very, very soft purlin, multiply that you know, maybe up to oct octaves, select an RD, um, just uh, the opacity here is, you know, you know, you get some soft sort of break up here and there. You know, there are a whole, whole, whole bunch of things you can do, but I'll, actually, let's see how that looks. That's pretty, that's pretty cool, actually. All right, so it's a little bit over the top, so I'll reduce the opacity sort of make it look like it used to be there, but it's been washed off or scraped off the surface. Look like that, and let's take a look at sort of a grazing angle here, getting some a little bit of breakup here and there. And if we check out the roughness, you can see here, there it is. So let's look at the grazing angle here. Let's see, yeah, I'm not sure how well this is being picked up on the stream, but it's subtle, but it's 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 there. All right. So what next? Let's do the edge grease. So as I mentioned before, like we already sort of started um, defining that by masking out the edges on the grain wood here, but let's take it one step further and add a little bit more uh, sort of layering layering to the surface. So once again, I'll do a new layer and I'll set this to multiply because I want to let I want to let the underlying information through, but I want to, you know, have it sort of interact a little bit. And I'll find a good color, maybe some like light yellow, something like this. And then I'll reduce the roughness because I, I want these edges to be quite reflective and obviously it's looking pretty crappy right now but I'm sure we'll get there Maybe like that we'll change it later on I guess so I'll make a, a new mask stack I'll reference the base wood here 
I'm so glad we named these. Or I named these. There we go. And I'll really pump it up. Pump up the range. Like 0, 05. And let's try and meet them up a little bit. Like something like that. Looking repetitive, looking pretty ugly, but we can sort of see what's what's going on, what I'm thinking here. So we're gonna be using using this and the curvature to really, really grease the edges up. So once again, a curvature. And this time I'm gonna use edges only. So if we hop in the mask view. So the hotkeys for them that I keep using is a nine uh, to see the result of the layer mask. And if I press zero on the keyboard, I'm only going to oops, I'm only going to see the, the current mask, like the result of the current mask. So now I'm only seeing the map and I'm seeing the curvature. So I'll go back to the layer mask and I'll really, really push this down. So we're getting some super bright edges here. Like maybe zero one five. I warned you there was going to be a lot of me tinkering with levels. <laughs> Something like this. So now we're getting sort of what I was looking for. And so like, I really love the fact that you can you know, adjust this in real time. There's no loading time or wait times or anything like that. So at this point, I feel pretty happy. So I'll go in here and adjust the values. I'll maybe make it a bit... I guess pull both ways. No, I think I like it darker, a bit better. Something like that. And reduce the opacity of the layer. Now I can sort of check out the, the roughness here. I'll drop it down even further. Maybe that's a bit too much. I don't know. So there's always a lot of sort of hopping back and forth, which, you know, but it's, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with, I'm fine with that because everything is instant. There's no sort of loading or waiting. So let's take a look here. I'll set this to multiply. I forgot to do that. And I'll take this down, something like that. Now we're getting some nice breakup along the edges here. Check out the mask again. As you can pull, I'm really liking how the edges here or like sort of bigger, like around this, around this edge here, or, or the crease. It's looking pretty cool. So I'll just tweak the colors again, make it a bit darker. Cool. All right. It's turning out pretty nice, I think, if I may say so myself. So next up, you know, you have a, we have a lot of information to work with here. So. What I want, we have the grains from two different layers. We have, you know, so I'll go into this one here and play around with the strength of the normals. I'll try and boost this like zero or 1.3 or something. We can see the result here, I guess. Maybe really subtle, maybe. It's a bit stronger because I wanna, I wanna work with the big grains and sort of define them a bit more. I guess one could say it's that would be a bit stylized, but you know, I, th I think I think that usually looks pretty cool. Um, sort of picking up the picking up the uh, like the um, both the valleys and the and the like the peaks and the bottoms, so, so to speak, of the of the um, grains. What's the word? So once again, let's start off by making a mask here and do a curvature, and then. I'm gonna really up the tightness here. Like maybe 0, 6, 5 ish, something like that. And let's take a look at the map. So you can see what's happening here when I'm pulling the slider. Something like, like so. And once again, try and meet in the middle, like 0, 5 ish, 0, 6 ish, maybe. Something like that. So as you can see here, we're really picking up these, these, uh, these grains here. Thanks to the uh, uh, thanks to me increasing the tightness. If we adjust it even more, you can see what's going on here. But I think a value of like zero six five is pretty good. Nice. So let's go ahead and use the other wood layer now. So once again, I'm using layer map, and I'll take the grain wood here. 
And the good thing about reusing layers like this is that you're obviously you're reusing them. So you don't have to load a whole bunch of new textures. So um, the more you can reuse, the better. And generally, there's a lot of information in these um, these, these, these uh, textures that you can use and sort of modify to your liking. So um, be creative when you're working with it. I'll set, instead use the roughness this time. So if we jump into the mask, you can see sort of the difference here. So we're seeing a really big difference around around the vein, uh, the grains here. The roughness, and I'll invert it. I've, yeah, I'll invert it and set it to multiply. And once again, punch up the levels or the range. Something like that, maybe. Uh, Pull down there. There we go. So now we're really picking up these these areas in these dark grains, okay, which I think looks pretty cool. So we can adjust the this one here. So basically, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to both pick up the grains and I'm also trying to balance out um, balance out the darks so that it matches the um, the the lighter areas a bit more. Because if we remove this, you can see there's like it's very very stripy. And by doing this, we can sort of bring in a little bit of brightness into the um, into the um, darks. So I'll set this to like a actually I guess I could sort of color pick here. Just make the eyedropper size a bit bigger so we can pick up a average value. That's pretty cool. So if we sort of toggle on and off, you can see see what I mean. That's pretty nice. So I'll reduce the opacity because I don't want it to be exactly the same color and I do want to let some underlying information through here. That's cool. And at the same time, you can you know you can adjust the roughness you want if you want a dip, little bit of break up here. Like say you want this to be be a bit bit uh, shinier, just sort of you know punch it up if you want to. Um let's take a look down here. I'm just sort of eyeballing it here, but I think that's that's pretty cool. What do you think, Jonathan? Oh, you don't want to know what I really think. <laughs> no, I just fantastic. want to put you on the yeah, spot. It, it absolutely does look <laughs> fantastic. Uh, I think people are really appreciating this too. We haven't, contrary to a lot of our streams, we haven't been getting a lot of questions on the process here, which means you've been doing a really good job of going deep into this. And that is what we promised in the beginning, guys. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, look at the re reflectors. Yeah, I can't even talk. The roughness on that. Look at it. Yeah, so, like, my my reasoning for this, and, you know, there's obviously there's going to be a carpenter out there going, like, no, 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 that's not the way it is. But, you know, I think it looks cool. Like, um, I, I'm thinking these sort of dark and deep grains, sort of, they, they're deeper, like, they're sort of you know, bumped into the surface a bit and sort of retain the va um, the the, the uh, lacquer a bit more. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, Thinks it, I think it looks cool. So, look, man, sometimes all it has to do is look cool. Yeah. Word. That's all it is. <laughs> it doesn't have to be 100% perfectly accurate. It just has to look cool. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So I think we're, we're making some good progress here, and we're about just over halfway through. So I'm thinking I'm going to have to sort of speed this up. So there's one more thing that I want to do. And that is to try and add some of those sort of deep cuts that I showed you before in the reference. So if I, once again, just make a solid layer, you see there's a whole bunch of solid layers, which in my opinion is good because I'm, I'm using texture information, but not for the actual different channels. So I'll make this a, like a woodish color. I pull it down towards the brown maybe. You can always tweak that later, once again, word of the day. And I'll do a map. And I'll try and find a good library asset um, that has some um, that has some scratches. I think there's like a good plastic with a lot of nice uh, nice cuts in it. Let me see if I can find it. Mm -mm -mm. I was gonna say I like that horizontal scratched one that you just passed by. Yeah, it's not it's not the one I'm looking for. I'm looking. There it is. There it is. Ooh, this ah. is a good one. This is a good one. So if I just take this and invert it, see that? You see that? There we go. Look at those cuts. 
you know, I was going to say this feels like cheating, but it's not. <laughs> it's just doing things in a way that is most time and cost effective. Yep. So now this looks more like almost like paint splatter all across the surface. So let's repeat the technique that I used before. Set this to from above. Just up the threshold a bit, reduce the wrapped underlying, and you can see how it sort of cuts into the mesh here. Obviously, we don't want to overdo it. We just sort of want to just nick the wood surface there and reduce the albedo to, to let some of the underlying texture information through. Maybe 50% like that. And we'll hop back into the mask stack. And I'll try and limit this more towards the edges, but not exclusively. So I'll do a curvature. No, not a position gradient, a curvature. Man, there's so many things I want to show you guys. We only have so little time. So let's bump this up, do a soft mesh. So we got some larger edges here. And let's do a multiply. And let's sort of try and finagle, finagle this one around a bit. We reduce the opacity. Just toggle the on, soft mesh on and off. Try and adjust the tightness. Once again, I'm just eyeballing it here. You know, Victor. What? I don't think anybody's going to hold it against you with us all being stuck inside these days if you want to run a little longer to show off some more stuff. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I think, yeah, there we go. It's, it's a nice big chunk, uh, a gash here. That, Sort of weighing a bit more towards edges, but not exclusively, as I said before. Like we can sort of toggle it on and off. You can see what's going on. Like we're getting some cuts, but it's sort of nice gradients across the rounder surfaces. So I'm happy with that. That's pretty cool. That's a nice little extra detail. And let's see if we can sort of squeeze one more thing in. Like let's just so we can, we can demonstrate one more component here. And let's do some dust. Uh, so we can just leave this as a 50% gray. And the easiest way to do this, I think, is to use the normal component. So as you can see here, now we're, we're sort of projecting, like we're like shining light. It's almost like shining light from the right side here. Uh, and this is using the normal information to sort of, no, it's almost like it's shining a light, as I said. You can move this around to where you want it. And obviously for dust, I want it to mainly be located in, 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 in services that are, that are facing upwards. So if we take a look at the mask here, I can once again adjust the range to make it tighter or softer, you know. So I'll find a nice spot. I think this is nice, nice and subtle. It's picking up the grains here. So something like that. And what I can do is if we can just find the layer where I used that map, I think it's, it was the paint layer the paint, yeah, the grunge one. So I'll just view this online. I'll copy the um, copy the ID, hop back into this layer here, make a map component, do a library asset once again. Just use the same material, use the same texture. I'll multiply the underlying. Once again, just doing a quick projection to make sure it tiles nicely across the borders, UV islands. We'll and angle these around, maybe soften the opacity a bit. And now we can go in and tweak the color values a bit. Let's try something like that. And let's take a look at how it affects the roughness here. I think it's a little bit too strong maybe. So let's drop the opacity down, something like that. And I think the albedo is a tad too strong as well. Like I just want this to be a really subtle effect something like that we toggle it on and off you see it's a very subtle effect but you know the devil's in the details that is fantastic man you know we've had a couple of uh, requests so far to see this on an actual 3d surface and i know of some good ones in the library you could probably test it out on yes i think i know which one you're talking about so let's open up the library Oop. I selected it really quickly. Sorry about that. Yeah, this is the one uh, you were referring to, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So as you can see, it aligns nicely. Um, works out of the box. 
pun intended. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> And you know, if you wanted to, you could just load another smart material and sort of paint, um, you know, paint a mask for these hinges. Uh, we'll take a, you know a minute or something. We can check out the like wooden bench here, sort of see how that would look, more worn down or lacquered. I think this is way more like a bright wood originally. So we toggle the base layers here. Yeah, and let's toggle it back on. There we go. Looking way more worn and has a lot more. Of detail around the edges there, if you see the reflectance up there. I think this is one case where the uh, the modified version looks a little better than the actual scan itself. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's yeah, and it, I mean, it's you know, if you have a project where, like, um, let's say you're making a western scene and a church or something like that, where you know things is dried up or very dried wood and things like that, you know, this is perfect. Like, you know, use it as it is. But let's say you want to make it a bit grimier, maybe a horror version of a church. You know, bam, this on is like a lot grimier. You can make it even darker and grimier if you want to. So I think, I think, you know, using this sort of transfer transfer styles across meshes really, really sort of makes the the, the entire library even more useful. And you know, as you can see, like I'm I did this in you know what is it 40, 45 minutes and like while talking about it. So. Like it's a super quick workflow and I absolutely love it. And it's, you know, something I, I do in the evening sometimes is fire up Mixer to try and, you know, make something look different. Uh, super fun uh, practice to also take an asset and try and mimic the material that's on the asset and then sort of apply that to other meshes. Um, that's something that I did for, actually, let's save this. Uh, just stream wood or something like that. If you want to go hey, back. hey, Victor, while we're on the subject of saving, uh, oddly enough, you happened to save right as someone demanded that you save because he was getting anxiety looking at you <laughs> not saving. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I that. was feeling it a little myself, to be honest. Uh, we do have a, uh, a I have confidence in audience. Mixer, you know. uh, one of our audience members would like to know if you could share your PC setup with us. So my PC, uh, this is my home PC, um, you know, working from home and everything. Uh, it's a... What is it? I9 uh, 99. What is it? 9980? No, 9900 uh, Intel processor, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, and a 2080 Ti. Um, then I'm, you know, uh, SSD, um, an M2 drive, and I th also think I have a regular drive. I'm not sure. But I guess that's sort of the key, uh, key components. 2080 Ti gang. <laughs> so what I wanted to quickly mention before about sort of the style transfer, uh, maybe not maybe maybe not a perfect example. Like this is more where I was inspired, um, inspired by by material on an asset. So like this is this is the asset in the library, and this is like a smart material that I made um, based on that. And the cool thing, like not only not only are you able to transfer this style to another asset, but you're also you're also opening up for a lot of customizability. So let's say I go in here to the sort of concrete layer here and adjust the range of the normal. So now I can actually get some like sort of dried up concrete on the top here, which is not which is not in the actual scan, but you know now it is. So I guess I could use it like this as well, you know. Um, so that's something that's pretty cool as well. And you know, it doesn't take too long to set up. Um, and you know, if you can, you can, you can adjust the, the edges like that, you know, now it's some concrete, concrete train undercarriage. Um, and I just, I just love adjusting these sliders. Like you can sort of see the concrete just growing. Ah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> if, mesmerizing. And I guess you could just take a look at another uh, smart material that I put together the other day, which is a heavily oxidized copper uh, statue material. Um, I, I used a, like a Buddha statue as a reference for this. Um, you know, it's if I go into the oxidization, uh, I could just tweak the edge mask here to a you know, get a completely different look. Like if I wanted, if I want more uh, sort of copper to shine through and make the make the um, 
what's it called? The um, uh, in, not imp interpolation, but yeah, transition. If I want the transition to be to be sharper, you, I can just drag this up, softer, drag it down. So you know, it's super fun, and I, and I can apply this to you know any type of asset. So let's actually I have a pretty cool one. If you sorry for hopping back and forth, but I want to use the the rust here. So I'll just apply this to a couple meshes. So you can see what I'm talking about. And by the way. Um, I am going to cover uh, tool bag three as well, uh, really quickly. Um, sort of set up how, set up a good scene for rendering out your your creations from uh, from Mixer. Just want to demonstrate a couple um, couple assets here. So if we take say a, a barrel, I'll do this one. A crumpled up version. You can see like it like it just transfers so nicely like the directional details and the edge edge wear we can sort of toggle the original with a new one like obviously well I, I, maybe barrels do get this rusty i don't know i guess it looks like it's on it's it's, it's, it's getting there like just give it a little nudge there we go so yeah without getting too sort of caught up in that let's, let's, let's take a look at how to present uh, the wood there um, in in Toolbag 3, a wonderful piece of rendering software. So let me just uh, load in the sort of box or crate mesh that we had in Mixer before that we talked about. So generally, like when you start when you start Toolbag, you get a random sky, um, and very rarely does it end up does it, does it start with the ones that I like. I have a couple of favorites, and I guess I guess everyone has their sort of go to. HDRIs, um, but the one that I use almost exclusively is the indoor fluorescent. So as you can see, it's really really bright out of the box. But you know, once we add textures and you know change the uh, contrast and everything, that's gonna uh, sort itself out because we're using a hundred percent white material now. Um, so next up, I'll just go ahead and change the tone mapping from linear to aces. I either use hail or hegel uh, or aces when I when I make these when I when I create sort of presentation scenes. But yeah, so that was like the first step. It, I always do is I load the preset, uh, the preset sky, just uh, you know, because it, I know I'm gonna use this one, so I just prefer to set it right at the beginning. And next, I'll just I I, I can just use the default material here and. I have, the, I have the maps here pre-exported, so I'll just drag the albedo onto the albedo slot, and I'll do the normal in the normal slot, and I'll do the metalness like that, and the roughness like so. So as you can see, now it's now it's pretty dark just because we have some pretty dark materials on here. So let's go ahead and adjust that. So I'm gonna be covering a few areas. I'm gonna look in, be looking at the sky, the ca uh, camera, render settings, and some material settings, and also some compositional uh, tips and tricks here or suggestions. So first thing, if you look at the sky here, you can see a preview. And instead of adding lights manually, I find it easier in most cases to just sort of click on the or on the point where you want a a, um, a light shining from. So now you can see we're we're getting some some shadows being cast. We're getting some brighter uh, some brighter highlights, and um, we can add a couple more. So either you can sort of specify them in their sort of actual physical position in the world, or you can you know just rotate them manually should you want to. Um, but I'll go ahead and add another light here on this side, so we're sort of covering both both sides. And then I'll do a light here from like the table to get some warm and bounce light. So this is generally the way I set it up, sort of having this triangle of lights. Uh, and then I always, almost always go in and tweak them manually, um, which I'll do now. So I'll first off set the contact refinement. Like this is gonna be my main main light here, skylight one. So we can, we can name this key light, I guess. We can name this I don't know, rim lights, I think I'm gonna use this as. 
Oops, gotta fix that. And then just do a fill light, like so. Here's a studio setup. So let's go into the key lights and up the brightness a bit. So let's rotate it, rotate this around so we can get a better idea of sort of what we're getting here. Let's rotate it back. And I think it's a little bit too high, so I'm gonna rotate it down. And one thing that I learned after <laughs> too long after I started using Toolbag is if you hit Control T on your keyboard, you're switching from local space to world space uh, on the gizmo. Super useful and just makes everything so much easier when manipulating lights. So let's rotate this around. I think this is a pretty good spot here. So we're lighting up the side of the box like that. And then we can start adjusting the rim light. So what I want this to do is sort of shine from the back here, sort of highlighting the, the lid. So I'll once again do contact refinement, uh, up the brightness, and we'll just adjust the position a bit. Rotate it like that. Getting some, picking up some really nice highlights and grains there. Pretty cool. And up the brightness of this one. I guess I'll do this trying to find a nice balance between these two lights. And let's not forget the fill light here, which is sort of adding in some color. Oops, let me select it again. Just rotate it so we can see what's going on. So what I like to use these for is just maybe fill in some some of the dark dark shadows here. Um, I'll reduce the saturation a bit, make it a bit darker now that we're we know where it is. So it doesn't have to do much. It's just there to lighten, lighten the image up just a little bit. We toggle it back on and off. You can see what's going on. It's not huge, but we're getting a lot more, um, you know, um, image data to work with in here. So there's a pretty good start. And let's go ahead and look at the render settings. So there are a couple of things here that's gonna make your renders look way better. Like by just by just hitting some hitting some check boxes, and one is uh, local reflections. This is generally important when you're working on highly reflective surfaces like metals or you know plastics things like that. And then I I'm gonna change the shadow resolution to ludicrous. Love that name by the way. And then I'll enable GI. This is a big one. It just makes like this is a make real button. It just I love what this does to your renders. And you can adjust the resolution of the voxels. You can actually sort of preview what your sort of voxel GI generation looks like. I'll set this to high, and it almost looks like the image itself. So if we hop back out of the show voxels, I guess we can toggle the GI once again. Just look at that. All right. And last but not least, I like to uh, enable image occlusion. Just drag around the slider here. I, I tend to max this out just because I like it. Sometimes I turn it back down. I guess it depends on the asset and sort of the look I'm trying to, I mean, I'm going after. You can always adjust the size of this as well. But in this case, it's, it's very subtle. So I'll just, I'll just max it up there. Next, something that I feel really makes the, the textures pop in a lot of cases is if you click the cogs here next to each of the maps, you can actually disable use mip maps. I mean, just, yeah, I guess it's kind of hard to see in the stream and especially on the metalness map, but it makes a huge difference. So if we disable mip maps there, I mean, I, I can see it here, but yeah, I don't know if the stream picks it up. And I can the, see it. That's good. And let's do the normal map as well. Boom. Look at those grains popping there. Yeah, I think you'll see the most uh, difference in the normal map versus yeah. anything else. And then, last but not least, I just, you know, you can adjust your anisotropic filtering and, or you can turn off the filtering altogether. And just look at that. Now it's getting a lot of details. And it might be grainy in the viewport here, but once you do a high, uh, high resolution capture, it's just gonna look super crisp and nice. The only thing I would suggest here would be to lower the background brightness a bit. Yes. I'm getting to that, Jonathan. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm, let's let's do that right now, just so it doesn't bug bug you. So you have you have a couple of things here you can change. 
for the background. Obviously, like th this is not really gonna matter in the end because I'm I'm gonna use a transparent background when I render this out anyway. But you can use an ambient sky, which is a which is a super super blurry version of the HDRI. Like if you look around, it's like you can sort of see the floor there and like the ceiling there, or you can use a blurred sky, which in which you can actually adjust the blur yourself. Like so. But what I like to use generally is just a flat uh, color like this. And I like to drop the saturation altogether, unless I want to do something really cool, like splashy, you know, woo. But generally I like to reduce the um, saturation. I'll try to find a nice semi-bright background. And there we go. So let's just do another another round at the lights here. Because one something else that is worth keeping in mind is generally when you're using an artificial light, like you know, any, anything except you know, insanely bright light or the sun, you do get a little bit of softness in the shadows. And the way to get that is if we can, if I can just find out a good position for the lights, so we can see the shadows. If I increase the width here, we're actually softening them up quite a bit. Like obviously, so if we look at the left one here, because we're gonna get the radius sort of cutting through the mesh here. So look at the left side there. Or am I using the wrong light? Yeah, I think I was using the wrong light. Uh, okay, so let's try the f rim light and do the width. There we go. Okay, so you see how, how everything sort of softens up a bit and is less razor sharp. That's something that sort of helps sell the realism in a lot in many cases, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I like to do that and just. That's looking pretty cool. Let's, oops, let's rotate it back to a good position, like so. Just rotate this around. This looks good. Let's do the key light here, like that. And just scooch the fill light over and up the brightness a little bit, like that. There we go, perfect. All right, we're getting there. And I I, I, ha I have a set of of, of pre set up presentation scenes that I like to use depending on assets and projects and things like that. So what I like to do is um, like for for these small materials, like I'm rendering out uh, in really high resolutions, but let's set this to like five thousand times five thousand. Um, enable transparency. Uh, sampling can be sort of anything above six, sixteen times in my opinion, and. Um, just make sure transparency is enabled because it just allows you to composition everything so much better. And if we hit OK, we are theoretically ready to render, but you know, especially since this is a rectangular object and it's a bit longer, you know, it's wider than it's high, it's always hard to sort of see, know what's gonna appear in the render because the viewport is is wider than it is at all. So it could be a problem. So if you just go into the camera and hit safe frame, you can actually see what's gonna be rendered depending on the aspect ratio you, um, the resolution uh, results in. So now we can easily go in here, position this. Maybe we want to just rotate this up a little bit, maybe angle it, get a nice snazzy angle here. And as a result, obviously I'm gonna have to readjust the lights ever so slightly. Key light, like so. And for the sake of, for the sake of the um, for brevity, let's let's say I'm happy with this. To save that out, I would just have to hit image, and it will save out the image on the de on the desktop. Um, um, you know, then you can just set it to whatever resolution you want and call it done. Um, so almost made it at a, at an hour. So I guess that leaves us a little bit of time for some Q&A if there are any questions um, that hasn't been answered yet. Yeah, uh, Jovika Smilesky wants to know why you didn't make that background as dark as I asked you to. Fine. <laughs> 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 All right, let's go in here. There, we there go. you go. Back. Look at those highlights popping now. My man. Yep. Good call. Good call. Look at that. Beautiful. That is a fantastic looking asset, though. I love how the, the light just plays off the surface through all those cracks and, and the, the little subtle bits of grime and dust on it. It's yeah, just awesome. Like, it's, it's just literal box spinning here. They're just <laughs> looking around. 
Never so. thought a box could look that good. <laughs> good scanners. All right, do we have any, oh. any more questions? Well, Rockstar Syndrome wants to know where the coffin dance background is, but I don't think we're doing that today. The, the coffin <laughs> dance background? It's a, well, I've seen it mostly in CSGO memes, but oh. yeah. I, I, I'm old. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm older than you. <laughs> True. Anyway. Huh, let's see. What else can we cover today? Uh, it looks like you, you went through most of it, man. I mean, like the, the lack of questions on the subject really shows that you just you nailed most of this, mm -hmm. um, good. which is fantastic because we've been having so many people ask for what's the best way to describe it? Very beginner friendly tutorials. And the fact that you've gone through and answered just so many people's questions before they were even answered or asked is uh, crazy. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> I've hope spent that, most of my time the case. typing out other stuff. Yeah. And uh, obviously, I had I had a lot of ground to cover in this video, so you know I I, I skipped explaining a couple of things, and you know I I could go into you know crazy detail about every single feature. But let's we have a lot of we have a lot of weeks, and we have a lot of months, a lot of years ahead of us. We can cover that in upcoming streams oh, yeah. and tutorials. So um, for those of you who sort of failed to uh, follow along in some steps, um, you know let let us know. Let us know what you, what you want to see more of, and and we'll we'll um, uh, try and. Um, uh, answer that for you and absolutely before i before i forget um this um uh, this scene here or a very similar scene that i that i uh, created prior to the stream uh we'll be making that available um uh, in the in the description below um in in this video and also um if we're sort of looping back to these references here that I the way that I showed you. So if you have any, like if you, if your studio, if your team has any requests for smart materials, you know, just toss one of these together, you know, maybe some game references, real world references, let it give us a brief explanation and we'll do our absolute best to sort of, um, uh, get that covered for you and, and uh, release some of those for you. So, um, yeah, you, you just send it via the forums or drop us in a, drop us an email. Discord, in, yeah. you know, anything works. Yeah, exactly. You know how to reach us. Hey, uh, there is a persistent question that I hadn't had a chance to, to ask you yet that has been uh, popping up quite a bit. Uh, a couple of users wanted to know, uh, before we wrap up, where you're getting a lot of your reference material from. I noticed you were using stock photos in some cases. Yes. Uh, I mean, generally, generally it's Google Images, but, you know, it's... I, I sometimes sort of just like whenever I start browsing for references, I it's it's like a rabbit hole. Like I, I just get sucked in. Like I start off by a, a quick like concrete on Google and I look at the images and I find a cool reference and then I sort of you know look at where that photo was posted. I go to the website and sometimes there's a big cache of uh, awesome photos and I get some again again inspired by those and they link to their affiliate or their 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 friends and things like that and you know i it's, it's kind of hard to say like i i don't have a place that i go to for concrete it's just you sort of you sort of build up um a library of sites you sort of start frequenting and um you know you start getting a good idea of which search terms to, to use like you know for for a lot of things like if, if you're searching for uh, worn metal like 99 percent of my results are like from games and art station and things like that so you know adding a photo as a search tag um you usually yield some better better results and then so, you know you can you can look look for metal metallurgy or metal, metallurgical sites metallurgic you know forums that focus on that kind of stuff you know it's um i found that google images is all, often kind of limited uh, as to what it's presenting to you. So you sort of have to jump down into that rabbit hole to find good references in, in my experience and in my opinion, at least. So sorry, I, I couldn't give you like, Hey, go to this website, uh, kind of reply, but that's, that's sort of what I'm doing generally. Right. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll echo on your point a little bit and say that as you know, one of your fellow colleagues and artists here in the company, one of the things I do uh, for reference gathering is I just have my phone on me all the time, like most of us do. Oh, yeah, and I just sure. take pictures of stuff all the time, just random stuff. Um, I built entire scenes based on just some concrete photos I found on the side of a bike trail. <laughs> so um, sometimes you just get inspired and uh, you got to let that inspiration take you to where it's going to take you to actually make something really cool. Yeah. 
So I think uh, I think we're pretty much wrapping it up here. I think we've uh, covered everything we've wanted to cover. Uh, Victor, it's been amazing having you on, man. You're uh, it's an absolute blessing to hang out with you for an hour. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a blast. It was super fun. I oh yeah, it. definitely. For those of you guys who don't know, if you're uh, new to our streams, one of the things we always mention at the end of every stream is that we have a fantastic 19,500 member community. We'd love to add more. And that is our Facebook group called the Quixel Art Community. And you can find that via the following link, facebook.com slash groups slash Quixel Tools group. We also uh, have a Discord server. I will paste that in chat before we sign off today. Uh, Discord is super active you'll find me you'll find the rest of our art team there um our support guys hang out there too we're always around to answer questions um just chat get to know you guys um it's always you know fun for us to get to know you guys and hang out with you and th sometimes you might even find some cool info on what we're coming up with next but i digress it's time to sign off for the day again victor thanks for being here with us and we'll see you guys again next time all right see you next time thanks for watching bye